I just want to quickly say thank God for the bringers amongst us, uh, those who have invited and brought somebody to church today. Um, thank God for you and welcome those who are here for the first time. We appreciate y'all. Today, by the grace of God, we will be enjoying yet another time of receiving insights into the conversations around the throne. But very quickly, I want to uh, make a, a couple of comments uh, just so that, you know, uh, we don't leave anybody behind. You know, I want everybody to be able to follow along because more of what is being shared in this season um, has to do with the things that have already been shared. And can somebody get me, Kayla, and whoever might still be cleaning up? Uh, they need to be here now. We will clean up later. We need to get started. We're running a campaign now. No man left behind. Oh, yes. Uh, we're, running, we're already running a tight ship, and so uh, we cannot afford really to leave anybody behind at this particular point. Um, so let's, um, let's have everybody's attention. Let's have everybody's uh, contribution and participation. Let's have all the shuns that are needed. All righty. God is good. So I'm going to give us a couple of moments to get situated. And um, while we're taking our time, I believe that Alan may already have a flyer for us. Yeah, I saw, I saw what you sent me. If you're ready to put it up. Okay, it's not fully ready. Okay, it will be ready. Uh, in the meantime, I want to remind us of no slumber. Come on now. Praise the Lord. Yes. The Bible says, give not sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. God is good. I'm just going to adjust my tie here a little bit so that that way there'll be one less thing my wife calls me out on when I get home. Oh, yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you the reason why in just a moment. So my wife uh, is one of those people who believe that whatever is worth doing is worth doing well. And so if you're going to put on that tie and make me look like that, you might as well just leave it at home. Praise God. My wife is like a school principal sometimes. But it's good. You know, God will give you a wife like that because he knows you need one. Yeah. So if your wife is policing you about, it's probably because you need policing. Because God is not the author of confusion. A lot of what we resist in other people is exactly what God is trying to get through to us. You understand what I mean? A lot. A lot of... I'm telling you if, you, if we would be humble, we would be lifted up. You see, if we would humble ourselves, we will be lifted up. There was a thought that I had, I think it was earlier today, just talking about relationships in general. And one of the things that occurred to me is that some people will still be married if they understood the order of heaven's transformation. You see, because a lot of what people complain about in fact, in, the, in, in, in my thought, I saw somebody who was, having a, who was complaining before the Lord about their ex-husband while they were still together. And I know if, uh, okay, let's just keep going. This person said, this brother does not care about me. If he cares about me, he wouldn't be spending that much time outside of the house with his friends, doing all of what his single friends like to do. If he truly cares about me, he wouldn't be doing that. And so basically what you were complaining about is you're complaining about things that are dividends of another transformation. The real transformation that the man needed to have had was that he should have learned how to put you before himself. But you weren't thinking that that was the transformation. You were just thinking about all of the dividends. Now, how can a man put you before himself? I can only put you before myself if I know where I stand. Because if I don't know where I stand, I might think that I'm putting you before me, whereas I'm putting you behind me, because my own coordinate is very much a requirement for where I place other people in my life. That is why Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So if you do not love yourself, first of all, you cannot love somebody else. So being able to shoot out love means you need to contain love. Because what you have is what you give. And as I was going through that thought, the Holy Spirit helped me to realize that that is exactly the way we are as 
Christians or believers and God wants us to operate at a higher, I mean, on a higher level. God needs for us to change the way we assess people, assess ourselves by not getting hung up on not seeing dividends of change and transformation, but to understand what the ultimate goal is. Because this person that I saw also said to the spouse, if you had known, or if I had known that that was what you wanted me to do, I would have done it, but I didn't know. Which is true, because many of us don't even know what the other person wants. We don't know what they need, we don't know what they're looking for, and eventually, after all the arguments and insults and all the destruction, we then realize, oh, you could have. And where I'm going with that tonight is that God does not want us to stand before him one day and say, but you could have just told me that that was what you wanted. The Bible says you are inexcusable, oh man. When, where did the Bible say that? The Bible said that in Romans chapter 1, after the Lord said, from the visible elements of this world, you have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of eternal powers. From what you're observing, you know exactly the way God wants to deal with you. And that is the reason why the Bible says you are inexcusable. And so what God did from the beginning was to lay it out and to let us know exactly what he wants in the end. Just imagine those folks who stood before Jesus when they were being denied the commendation and, the and, the, and they were being denied access or entry into eternal life. Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I do not know you. But they were like, we did miracles in your name. Some of them could have turned around and said, if we knew all you cared about was how much we care about others. We, would, we may not have bothered with all of what we put into working miracles and staging events and doing all of these things. We would have just been faithfully daily treating others as though they were you in human form. Because the ones who received the commendation, that was all they did. They treated everybody they met as though God was in them. And that was what God told us from the beginning. He says, now let us make man in our image and after our likeness. But you know the reason why many of us don't treat people as though they are made in the image and in the likeness of God? The reason why we disrespect people, the reason why we cuss people out, the reason why we have negative expectations of people is because we allow ourselves to be defeated by darkness rather than defeating darkness. The Bible says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The reason why you treat people the way you do is because of the ones who have disappointed you. It's because of the ones who have let you down. It's because of the ones who themselves have been taken over by darkness. And so because somebody disappointed you once, you now become skeptical of everybody else. You see, the reality of it is we need to live ready to be disappointed, to be slandered, to be, to be, to be backstabbed, to be done all of those things too. We need to live ready for those things while we continue to do good things. Because self-preservation is an animal instinct and you are above that level. You know when Jesus came, he already knew that he was going to be spat upon. When Jesus came, he knew that they were going to pull him by his beard. When Jesus came, he knew that all of those things was going to happen. That he would come to his own and his own will reject him. He knew, but guess what? He came anyway. Because he had already seen the book in heaven where it was written concerning him all of the days of his life. And that was the reason why he told the apostles. He says, behold, I go as it has been written of me in the volume of the books. He knew that Judas was going to betray him. And you know what he told Judas? He didn't tell Judas to go and think about it. He didn't say, Judas, uh, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, maybe, maybe you don't want to do that. He told Judas, he said, what you must do, do it quickly. <laughs> it wasn't as if Jesus was so anxious to go to the cross, but he was just so eager to save you and I. We need to be so eager to show the love of God and to model Christ to other people such that no bad behavior will hinder us from being true to the love of God. Let me tell you something. We are coming into a season, and now that Kayla is here, I can tell you, one of the things that we're expecting in this new year that we have come into 
Because you know, at Communion House, we come into the new year before everybody else, or before most people, I should say, simply because if you have the opportunity to, why not? You don't have to wait until all the goodies have been taken. So what do we do? We press into the new year as we get into that September, October time. And you know, typically what I would do is sometime in the month of October, which is typically around this time, sometime in the third week of October, I will come and I will share with you a word of expectation for the year that is ahead. I have a word for you tonight, Communion House, concerning the year 2024 or 1584, if you're looking at the Jewish calendar, we have come to Halamoskiele Serum Dabayala Skuduvande. I want you to come with me to the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verse 7. And so, a lot of the expectations that we have of people that were not met were selfish expectations of what we will enjoy if they were as God wants them to be. If a man knew his place in God, he would love sacrificially and he would put others before him. Sometimes we're too obsessed with the fact that we'd, we won't get bothered if this man is doing right. Then we are about seeing that man be right. Let me explain that again. If Josephine, being a friend of ours, becomes a billionaire today, we would enjoy some of the benefits of that because we all know that it sucks to go on a cruise alone, right? Yeah, it does. And so when she's enjoying all of that wealth, she wants to go on a cruise, guess who's gonna be coming to? Yeah, you, you, John, everybody, yeah, even Gavin, everyone's coming. You, you go on a cruise, you go on a cruise, everybody goes on the cruise. That's because of the fact that the more the merrier, which is the reason why God made us, because the Bible says all things are his, and he was the one who has been from the beginning, so there was a time that he was all by himself, and he realized that it wasn't fun. And so he made you and I in his image and in his likeness, so that eventually we will become his children. But he couldn't just make us his children because then we would not be able to relate with him. So he first of all made us a part of creation to go through the process of what of transformation. And eventually through the process of adoption, we became his sons and daughters. Right? It has to be a process because you don't just meet a woman today and say, hey, beauty, I love the way you look and we have children now. And bam, she produces a child. If that happens at the dinner table, you will take off and run. Because there needs to be a process of formation, right? And the truth about the process of formation is the process of formation or pregnancy is essentially an opportunity. It is an opportunity for you to produce after your kind a being that has your attributes. It takes a while to imprint your attributes onto another. If somebody just gives you a ready-made baby, please take off and run. Simply because we don't know where that baby's composition is from. You understand what I mean? And so that's why it takes a process. It is an opportunity. God had an opportunity to introduce us to the lowest realm so that we can start from the base most in order for us to appreciate the uttermost. And so it's always better. So going back to Josephine, when she gets that money, either by marrying somebody that is very wealthy, which is okay, you understand what I mean? or just receiving an idea to make an air product that she patents and then it becomes a multi-billion dollar solution. It could happen in any way possible. Praise the Lord. Prophet, uh, get her. Come on. <laughs> but the, the, the reality of it is it is better. Now, many of us, the moment we receive that prophetic word, that Josephine is about to come into billions of dollars and suddenly have the power to do all of these things, we begin to think about all of what we will do together with her. It is not very likely that there will be more than one or two percent of us who would actually go to God and say, God, you are doing a new thing in the life of Josephine. I am thankful to you, but who is she becoming? You see, because a lot of what we possess is only a means to who we should become. Because it's all about becoming. 
Even when we were given Jesus, it was not just about possessing Jesus. The Bible says, for as many as have received him, even to those who believe on his name, have we given the power to become. It is not all about possessing. It is more about expressing the true nature of God. But most of us will think about what we're going to benefit from it. And that is the reason why God said, Jesus speaking, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. We don't just seek what we receive of the kingdom. We seek who we become by the kingdom. You understand what I mean? And so if you are focused on seeing your spouse become a man or a woman of God, instead of being focused on having somebody that is not going to be in the flesh all the time, instead of being focused on someone who is going to act foolishly half of the time, instead of focusing on what you tend to benefit from it, if you focus on what God gets out of it, you come more in partnership with God and are better positioned to see from heaven's perspective that which the Lord is doing. So I want to encourage us, let's stop thinking only about what we get out of it, but let's think about what God gets out of it. What we get out of it is what that person begins to do, but what God gets out of it is who that person becomes. So, as we are in this process of becoming, we need to have our focus on the end goal so that even when today is not looking like what Jesus expects you are not beating yourself up nor throwing the towel in because you know that there is an end the Bible says surely there is an end and the expectation of the righteous will not be cut off the reason why your expectations are kept alive and your hope is kept alive is because you know that there is an end and so Tonight, I want to share with us very briefly or quickly or just share with us what the end that God expects, what it looks like. Revelation chapter 22 verse 1. We're going to read 7, but I want us to um, see what is happening in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth earth had passed away also there were no more seas or there was no more sea not even a single sea was sighted which is interesting and then let us just keep over to verse 7 he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son my son in this case includes daughters as well so don't feel excluded it will be hap it will happen such that he who overcomes shall inherit all things so if you think about it there's going to be a new heaven there's going to be a new earth jesus is coming and is going to make all things new the wicked will be removed from the earth as the tears that were taken out of the field and they will be destroyed in hell let me say this again. You know, I like to challenge your theology. No, not the people here. The people who already know the truth. You, you guys watching online. I want to challenge your theology. Stop scaring people to God by telling them to run from hell. God is so majestic that he doesn't need to receive anybody because they're afraid of destruction. God is so awesome. The Bible says that God is love. God is looking for people that will come to him because he's a good God. You understand what I mean? If the only reason why I am in church or in the body of Christ or the only reason why I'm born again is because I'm afraid of going to hell, then it doesn't mean that I love God. It just means that I love myself. And the Bible says whoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God wants you to come to him because of who he is and because he is love. But we keep telling people that if they don't give their lives to Christ, which by the way, Jesus did not ask anybody to give him their lives. He says, I gave my life as an example so that you can do the same. Maybe that's the reason why we have a lot of wicked people in the church. Because they can only give their lives to Christ. But if you're next to them and you're dying, good luck. <laughs> 
because you're not worthy of their little life. When Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, that was what he said. He says the priest came and he saw the man that was wounded by the roadside. So there was a man who was wounded by the roadside. And people came by in the parable that Jesus told. And they saw this man that was wounded by the roadside. And this was 2,000 years ago before there were ambulances and before there was AAA and before you could call 911. It was your problem. Because now everything is the government's problem. So stuff that we should do, you see trash on the road, it's like someone's going to pick it. What happened to your own hands? It's your father's earth after all. But back in the day, they had nobody else to call. So the wounded man that was on the roadside was first of all seen by a priest. A priest came by and he was like, oh, I would have loved to do something, but I've got priestly things to do. After all, God is expecting me. And how do I tell God that I'm delayed to arrive at the temple because I was helping a man wounded on the side of the road? And the Levite came. Several people came by and they prioritized what they thought was of importance, which is their own statuses. Is that even a word? Is that the plural of status? Status? Statuses? Whatever. Their own profile. They prioritized their own significance. That's the word that I'm looking for. And importance over that of another person. But when the good Samaritan came, and the Samaritan was somebody who was expected not to even make heaven because the Jews didn't think much of them. But the Samaritan came and Jesus said, the priest wasn't a good priest. The Levite wasn't a good guy. It was this Samaritan that was a good guy because he did a good work. He stopped and he took the man, gave him first aid, and then took him to an infirmary and paid for him to be looked after and ensured his recovery before he went on his way. But what do we see in the body of Christ today? What do we see in our world today? People claim to have given all of their attention, all of their lives, all of their money, everything to Jesus. And so when the brothers and sisters of Jesus have a need, they don't have anything to offer anymore. Jesus said to those people that he commended on behalf of the Father, he says, come into the rest of your Lord, you faithful and you good and faithful servant. And they were like, but you just told the miracle workers and the TV evangelists and the booksellers and the conference holders you just told all of those people who did signs and wonders in your name to get out. Why are we qualified? Jesus looked at them and he says, you were the ones who fed me when I was hungry. You gave me water when I was thirsty. You clothed me when I was naked. You housed me when I was homeless. And they said, when did we do that to you? All we wanted to do was to meet you, but we never did while we were on earth. He said, oh, you did. More times than one. He said, every one of those people that you attended to, that was me. He said, whatsoever you do to the least of the brethren, you do also unto me. It's because God hasn't changed his mind. He made man in his image and in his likeness. And he put what inside of man. The Bible says, after having formed man from the dust of the earth, he breathed into man the breath of life. That breath is called the spirit of God. The word spirit is the word ruach, which means wind, which means air. So God basically put his life into man. So everybody that you see, regardless of how much darkness is coming out of them, has the life of God. Because without the life of God, nothing can live. Satan hasn't started giving life. John chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible says all things were made by the word of God. And there was nothing that was made that was made without him. Even those demons running around tormenting people are running around because God gave them life. The Bible says God is the father of all spirits and the God of all flesh. Anything that has flesh is a creation of God. Everything that has life is from God. But we forget because we think that, oh, I've given my life to Christ. No, Jesus says, no, I don't want you to give me your life. What will I do with your life? I mean, think about it. You are the one who needs my life. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. This life which I now live is what? It is the glorified life of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But it wasn't, it's not a fair exchange if Jesus gives his life to get mine. Yeah, that would, that would not be fair. That would be so unjust. 
Because the moment Jesus gives up his life in exchange for mine, just because he wants to have my life, then what's going to happen to all of eternity that he had lived and all of what he's done? Because I was just here. I got here just yesterday. You see, it's, it's robbery, however you look at it. And so what he did was he modeled an example so that you can go ahead and do the same. What was I saying about the people who gave their lives to Christ? No, it doesn't even matter. We'll, we'll get to it again. The reality of the times that we're in is that we need to remind ourselves of what truly matters because there is a lot of confusion in the world. So as we come into this year 2024, we need to set the sail of our expectations to be in alignment with the wind that God has sent to move us to the other side. He said, he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. If that was you that Jesus was saying this to, which is you now that you're hearing about it because his word, his spirit, his word is life. He's telling you that I'm going to make all things new. Old will pass away, all will become new. And then you get to inherit everything. Would you not want to inherit everything? I mean, if you, if you don't care about inheriting anything, you just want life to be over. Let me see your hand up. Well, praise God. Thank God that we're very godly people. And content. You see, what I was saying earlier, thank you Holy Spirit, is... We need to re register or let it register in our hearts that when we seek God, we seek the kingdom and we seek the righteousness of the kingdom. It is only right for you to experience what God has promised. And he has promised to give you all things, but there is a condition. And what is the condition? Only those who overcome shall inherit the kingdom. Can I say that again? Not the ones who speak in tongues, not the ones who heal the sick, not the ones who raise the dead, but it says the ones who overcome. Since my eyes have been opened to see this truth, all I want to do now is to overcome. But many of us, the reason why we're not overcoming is because something happens to us on a regular basis. Maybe not as often as you would want it, but it happens to us all the time and it looks like overcoming, but it is not overcoming. And you know what that thing is? Survival. Surviving sometimes looks like overcoming. You can survive the flu every year, but that doesn't mean you have overcome the flu because that flu can get you again next year. Doesn't matter how anointed you are, it can get you. Because as long as you are in this flesh, certain things are just part of the human experience. You can't stop eating, for example, and just say, well, I'm just going to fill myself with the word of God going forward. You can keep the food, no thank you. Well, the time is coming wherein you might be able to do that. But for now, you, that body, that is that tool that you need for getting around needs food. Not as much as we think it does, but it does need food. You may not need it every day. In fact, the reality of it is that our body does not need food every day of any given month. You know, your body actually doesn't want food every day of any given week. That's why it's, it's healthier and better for you to skip days and just not and just give your body time to consume the waste or the excess or whatever it's storing in your body. You know, that you don't even need to be a nutritionist or haven't gone to school to understand that. It's very basic. The reality of it is that when you find your body carrying more than you want to or that you should, then it tell your, you know that certainly this is extra material or extra resources. And if we keep bringing in new resources, when are we going to use the extra? It's like you're storing food for the apocalypse. Let me come here because I'm standing too close to my wife when I say that. You're storing food for the apocalypse and the apocalypse is taking a sweet time to come 
and then all the food that you've stored is now expired, but you keep buying more food. There's no sense in that. At least I know that now. That's enough, Alan. Yeah, don't, you don't have to rub it in. <laughs> oh yeah, that was because when they told us that the apocalypse was coming, they told us that the apocalypse was destruction. That apocalypse was the zombie apocalypse. That there would be all kinds of chaotic things going on. Whereas the word apocalypse itself means revelation. I know, what a shame. Who knew? <laughs> because look at us now, we are in the apocalypse. Look at the things that we know now that we didn't know before. Up until recently, we thought we needed to scare people from hell simply because they were going to be tortured forever. And we, we preached that. We went, some of us went from door to door telling people, repent for heaven, sorry, for hell is at hand. And you wouldn't even find that in the Bible. What the Bible taught was to go around preaching. Jesus told his disciples, he says, go from door to door and tell them that the kingdom of heaven. So we were supposed to be preaching the kingdom of God. We were preaching hell. And the reason being that, some people whose names I'm not going to mention today, simply because we have new people, but the next time you come, I'll mention their name. So just be prepared. But I won't I will mention their names today. I don't want to scare nobody. Or do I? So, some people figured out that if they can get you to live in fear, they can easily take things from you. Most of us, when we're afraid, we let go of things. Because what we want to hold on to is their life. So you let go of assets and properties and things of value because you want to hold on to dear life. And so when people realized that many, many hundreds of years ago, they decided to start to introduce the concept of hell where people burn forever so that the fear of going to hell will make you to purchase forgiveness from them. You see, I'm still not mentioning anybody's name. But a group of people came together and they were selling cards that offer forgiveness and you can even buy the forgiveness in advance because you know how long it takes before you commit another sin. So you budget for forgiveness. And they would even quote scriptures. Like when God looked at man in Genesis, after man was driven out of the garden, and God was like, okay, this is the, this is the plan. Let's just keep going with the plan. Because you know some things sound very straightforward on paper. But when they start happening in reality, it's a different ball game. Can I give you an example, two examples of such things? When God was writing the episode of the Messiah going to the cross, he first of all wrote it on paper. That was what Jesus saw. He says, behold, I go as it's been written of me in the volume of the books. And God was like, in order for this thing to work, my son has to be born through a virgin. Write that down. Then one of his disciples, look at that one. He likes money too much. That would be the betrayer. He wrote it down, Judas. He created all of the roles and all of the scenarios and everything was looking great, nice and dandy simply because God wants a big family and so he would give the one son that he has to get many. And so he was really focused on that and on paper he looked really grand. But when everything started unfolding in reality, even God could not look at the play that he wrote. He looked away. When Jesus was on the cross, for the first time he could not feel the gaze of the Father. And he was like, uh, excuse me, Mr. Director, hello. You wrote and scripted this part. He says, my, he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. This was not the plan, or is it? Why have you forsaken me? But when he was writing it, it was like a nice plan. Example number one. Example number two, when he wrote the plan that at some point, they're going to make men and put him in a garden and then get him kicked out of the garden so that he can encounter eternal life through the Savior. Because remember that God already knew that man was going to fall. That was why it is said that behold the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the earth. God already knew. But the reason why we don't understand or we can't come to terms with God knowing ahead of time is because of the fact that when those things start happening different from what he wrote down, I mean, when what he wrote down started happening, he had a different emotion because of his love for us. And that is the reason why the Bible says that God regretted having made man. The word regretted there is the word sorry. He was sorry that he made man. So are we not saying that God made a mistake and he was not trying to fix it? No. 
He knew what he was doing because of what he wrote down. But when what he wrote down was now being played out, he saw the emotions, the pain of the ones that he created to love. He saw them in agony and he was sorry that he made them. I hope that helps somebody. Because I, I struggled with that for a very long time. I'm like, okay, God, if you know all things, you know the end from the beginning, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why are you sorry? Because he wrote it. It wasn't like it had happened before. He, he just, he had written everything. But when it was happening, he touched his heart because he was like, eh. Uh, when I was writing that stuff, I, I said he was going to suffer a pain and agony. But now that I am singing him, I, I want to jump in and change something, but I can't because I am God. I, I have integrity. I am integrity. I can't go against myself. You understand what I mean? Can I prove that to you? Jesus says the things that I say are the things that I've heard my father say. So when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and the Bible says that his pain was so intense that his sweat became as blood. He said, ah, I wish that this cup would pass over me. He says, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And that is how God operates. He wanted to jump in and do something, but he pulled himself back saying, nah, 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 nah. We have to see this thing through to the end. So when God made man, and he said he was sorry. One of the things that he said also was this. He says, I will not continue to put myself in this situation. I, I believe that's Genesis chapter 9. The Bible says that my spirit will not continue to struggle or wrestle with man. You see, because this dynamics is just, is a lot. It says because it, the thoughts of his heart are what they are evil continually. Isn't that what God said? He says, the thought of his heart, they are evil continually. He says, so I, I'm not putting myself in this situation. I would not continue to be in this situation. I, I would tell myself, this is what to expect. And even though I know that's what to expect, I don't want to have to deal with this for 900 years. Because at that time, people still lived for like 900 years. So he said, I am going to cut short the life of man. God did that because of you and also because of the love that he has for us. That love would not allow for him to see us struggle for 900 years. That love would not. So that was the reason why he cut short the life of men. He didn't cut short the life of men because we were too much of a bother to him. No, it was because our own lives were too much of a bother to us and it was like, ah, this is too much. Why did he say that my spirit, I would not put myself in this situation for too long? Because he knows he loves us so much that he can't stay away from us. So what do we see God do? God said that because of his love, but people took advantage of that in selling forgiveness cards by saying the thoughts of a man's heart are evil continually. So, Alexandria, you will sin again in two weeks. Buy cards in advance. And so people were buying forgiveness in advance. That was the origin of this story of people going to hell. Jesus told us what hell is. He said it is a lake of fire. He says there is whipping, there is gnashing of teeth. He says the worms there do not die. And what did he, after describing the glory of it, he told us the purpose of hell. He said, do not be afraid of the one that can kill the body. He said, but be afraid of the one that can kill both the body and the soul in hell. Jesus in John chapter 3 verse 16, he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. The word perish means to perish to cease to be. But we have chosen to tell people that if you don't believe in him, you will burn in hell forever and ever. And because of the fear of not burning in hell, people now come to God and God is like, I don't know these people because they don't love me. They only love themselves. They're not here for me. They're here for their bellies. We need to preach the right gospel. The right gospel is, are you still here worrying, being in sorrow? Allowing the devil to exploit you of eternal, I mean, to exploit you of all the goodies that God's given to you. Are you still here when there's a loving God who is willing to take all your cares? Where there is a loving God who wants to shower you with blessings. A loving God that you can cast your cares upon. A loving God who's wanted nothing more than to have a relationship with you. Why are you still here? Isn't that more of a good news than telling people, if I were you, I'd just say, amen in Jesus' name and escape hell. To be honest, I would do that for myself. One is merchandising, while the other is good news. The good news is that he's already done everything for you to come and live and reign with him forever. 
And someone is like, what does it matter as long as we get the job done? No, as long as you get the job done. But scaring people about hell in such a way that misrepresents God is not the way to get the job done. Let us focus on the love that he has as opposed to the punishment that we made up. And I say this because in my heart of heart, I truly want to read to you the next verse. I just read to you 22, Revelation 22 verse 7. But the next verse, if I, I figured, I mean, I really thought or think that this explanation will be a preamble that will help you to appreciate verse 8. Look at what verse 8 says. Verse 8 says, but the cowardly, unbelieving, <laughs> it's interesting that God is listing the cowards before the unbelievers. So the ones who believe, but become too afraid to live what they believe are worse than the ones who don't believe. Paul said, is it not better for us to focus on the ones who were never saved or who have yet to profess Christ the Lord than to continue to waste our time with the ones who once knew the Lord but now have denied him? He said it is harder to win them back than to save the lost. It is easier to win back people who have never known than the ones who have known but now think that God is their mate and they can mess God about. Because you know those people, they're not just, you're not just dealing with ignorance, now you're dealing with pride. And when you're dealing with pride, you're dealing with Satan. Okay, because dealing with a foolish person is one thing, but dealing with a satanic person is another. The cowardly are the people who did not tell others what God told them to say. The cowardly were the ones who were too afraid to lose their job, so they compromised and believed in the world rather than believe in the word. The cowards are the ones who are about to bow to the beast for bread rather than say that we choose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to compromise the name of the Lord. The cowards are the ones who have an opportunity to stand for Jesus but decided to deny him simply because of some material gain that is fleeting. May we not be in the company of the cowards but may we be those who are bold and courageous, those who know their God. The Bible says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is sulfur, but brimstone sounds more terrible. That's why we don't say sulfur. Have you ever been anywhere and they say it burns with fire and sulfur? Maybe one out of five times. But the majority of the time we use this old King James brimstone. Which is what? The second death. He didn't say eternal torment. It is a second death. When I told my wife this revelation, you know what she said? She was like, I will be careful to share that with people. She said, because you don't want to make it seem like, okay, if I don't follow Jesus in this life and the real punishment is that they just sent me to hell where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth because people are gnashing their teeth as their souls have been destroyed, as they experience the second death and I will cease to be because your Jesus says that that means I will perish, right? So if I cease to be, then I don't know what happens after that. So maybe I can just continue to live in sin. You understand what I mean? And I said, you have a point. I said, you have a very valid point because if we preach it this way, no one's going to buy our forgiveness cards. Which means, in general, people would not do anything out of fear. And God is okay with that because God wants to know the people that would choose him if truly they had a choice. But you don't give people a choice when you scare them that they're going to be in torment forever. Now think about it. You live for just about a hundred years, but you get punished for a hundred billion years. How is that even fair? Now, I'm not trying to rationalize. I'm just telling you what the word of God says. The word of God calls it eternal death. What is my message? My real message is that we need to encourage people to make their choices based on love and based on an appreciation for the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus made rather than scare them into self-preservation, simply because that is the genesis of survival instinct in our world. And if we are going to overcome, we need to destroy survival. Jesus did not say the ones who survive 
the Antichrist. He didn't say the ones who survive the tribulation. He said the ones that overcome are the ones that will inherit all things. People will survive tribulation and still not make it into the new Jerusalem. That's what Jesus says. There will, be, there will be people that will survive. They will not make it because the earth will continue to run. And, and when you read what he said in, 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 towards the end of Revelations, he said in the new Jerusalem, the new heavenly Jerusalem that is the bride of Christ, he said there will be going in and coming out only that unclean things will not be allowed in and the kings of the earth will bring tributes to the Lord and his saints. And so there will be people that will survive, but they will not make it into the new Jerusalem, into the temple of the Lord that is forever. So why do I want to be one of those people who survive, who is still made subject to all of what's going on on this earth? Not just me, but my offspring after me. God forbid that I be one of those people that get ruled over by some kings who would have to pay homage. Survival is beneath you. Survival is not the goal. Overcoming is the goal. We have survived long enough. It is not time for us to overcome. There are many men who have survived, lost, because they've been living in immorality and somehow getting by. There are people who have survived bitterness of heart because they just can't get themselves you know, to stop being bitter. They get so easily offended. You keep surviving all of those things. Many of us have survived financial difficulty, which the Bible calls lack. But then you get to be in lack again because you have only survived it in one season and it comes again in another season. The Lord is saying, I want you to do better than surviving. He says, I want you to overcome it. God wants us to overcome lust. He wants us to overcome fear. He wants us to overcome lack. If I have no integrity and I take what does not belong to me, the mercy of God can prevail and I can manage to survive without anybody knowing or without me suffering so much the consequences of what I have done. That is survival. But the Lord is saying, I don't want you to just survive. I want you to overcome. I want you to be a man that will no longer be under such inconsistency. I want you to be above it. Because the Bible says that it is the will of God that we should be above always and not beneath. I don't want you to go from this season to another season still struggling with lust, still struggling with lies, still struggling with lack, still struggling with lasciviousness, still struggling with all the ills, all the ills. The Lord is saying, no, I know you can survive because I made you and I gave you the instinct. You know what to do. Every time some kind of, of consequence comes, you come and beg me for mercy because my, 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 my mercy is available. The Bible says every day the sun rises, the mercy of God is renewed. And you can come boldly before the throne of grace where you obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Every time you fall into a lack, you cry to God, you beg people, you beg God, and somehow you survive that season, you make a little money again, and then you continue. And God is like, how much longer will you be on the wheel of survival when you can overcome? About three million people were told left, left Egypt. Were given the opportunity and the grace to be part of the Exodus. The Exodus was God's process of birthing them of taking them out of where they have been and put them and placing them on a journey wherein he had enough time to impress his dna upon them to bring out his attributes in them but guess what happened only two out of three million overcame only joshua and caleb overcame the rest were so they survived all kinds of things they survived the army of pharaoh they survived the red sea they survived the serpents they survived the thirst they survived the hunger but in all of these things they could not overcome the sinful nature that kept them from seeing the almighty god as a good god so this year 2024 communion house is our year to overcome it is our year to have a holy reflection on the things that we have survived and say that affliction will not arise a second time. It is our season to look at the things that we have survived and say no more am I surviving you, I am overcoming you. 
to survive is to remain in the wilderness and continue to have these temptations and experiences. But to overcome is to be in the promised land that flows with milk and honey. David says the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but I have seen the righteous. He will never lack anything good. The Lord wants us to do better than surviving. He wants us to overcome. He wants us to be victorious and be more than conquerors. Because only the ones that overcome will inherit all things. Survivors will benefit some things. They will, survivors, survivors benefit from some things. Sometimes you have a little peace for like three months before you get broke again. Sometimes you have confidence in God and a little bit in yourself for two weeks because you haven't given in to lust. Sometimes you, you count and you have five friends, and that's the first time in two years that you have had five friends for more than five days. You haven't said anything to hurt anybody. You haven't taken offense at anybody. And you're like, oh my God, I'm getting there. I'm grown up. And you're there. Please delete that from your mind. Whatever dance I just did. But, but the reality of it is this. You survive. And you keep commending yourself because of the fact that you get to benefit from your resolution, you get to have people to talk to. You get to feel confident to come to the house of God. Some people, when they're in lust and in unforgiveness and in all kinds of ills and vices, they don't have the confidence to enjoy what it means to be a child of God because guilt is getting the better out of them. So you get a little benefit for two weeks. You're, you're feeling like a believer again. It's like, man, I can't even remember the last time I looked at the women uh, lustfully. Praise God for my life. I am like Jeremiah now. You see what I mean? You think about all of those things and you're like, man, this year I've not had to use my credit card or borrow money. I'm doing good. No lack in my life. Praise God. And then because of the things that you're enjoying, you forget that you are not meant to only benefit from this and that. Jesus intends for you to inherit all things. It's got to be an all-rounded victory. But it is destined for only those who overcome. And by the grace of God, as we continue, I know God is going to give us more insights, great, great illustrations, so that we can get more into what it means to overcome and how we can overcome. But at least now we know we have an ending view. We have a goal. We have a target. We're saying we're beginning a season that will define the rest of our lives and possibly even usher us into eternity. A season where we will do better than ordinary men. A season where we actually bring to bear the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And let that power begin to show in us its marvelous work of fruits of righteousness as the trees that we are, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. We can do better than just getting by. The Lord wants us to do more than get by. The Lord wants us to get up. The Lord wants us to get there. The Lord wants us to become. And to become is to overcome. Now I'm already giving out all the goods, but you get it. We will come back here by the grace of God on Saturday and on the Tuesday after that, and we'll continue to dive deeper into the principles of overcoming. You see, but one thing that I would share with you today before you leave is this. Come with me to the book of Romans chapter 9. And then we're going to use this. Actually, we're still going to break bread with a scripture from the Old Testament. From the book of Psalms 113. In fact, let's just go there. 113 verse 6. Let's go to Psalms 113 verse 6. And then we'll break bread with that. And um, well, praise the Lord. This is only about 45 minutes. I'm so proud of me. And you. God is good. Praise the Lord. Psalms 113. Gavin, thank you so very much. Psalms 113, verse 6. The Bible says, Who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? Who humbles himself? To behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. This is talking about the Lord. You know, I told you that Jesus did not shy away from all of what will cost him to show us that he loves us. But he humbled himself even to the level of the death that he died on the cross. It was a death that was 
prepared for criminals and the one who knew no sin you know Jesus was not made a sinner the Bible did not say Jesus who was not a sinner was made a sinner no the Bible says he who knew no sin was made sin he was made sin itself because when you're a sinner you don't commit all the sins you don't even have all the you don't have the skill no one of us yeah no, none of us is skilled enough to commit all the sins you will be better at some things than the other you understand what i mean and so so as not to be mistaken the bible says he was made sin for your sake he humbled himself but you know the beauty of it was this when he humbled himself to behold he found precious things jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sold everything that he had to purchase a precious pearl he also says the kingdom of heaven is like a man who has different lands but he sold everything to find this one plot of land wherein he had found something precious when god humbled himself to behold what was going on on the earth he found you and i and oh my god aren't we so precious and the lord is saying <laughs> manuelita get her when i said we are so precious she said in his eyes oh yes that is the reality of it in the eyes of the one who is humble the bible says he humbled himself as we are going further the lord said to me that he has already chosen us to be a royal priesthood a holy nation and a peculiar people and those of us at Communion House, we can relate with that firsthand. Wherein God gives us a heads up on what things are going on in the world. He secures our heart. He gives us principles. He breaks things down to us through the prophetic teaching ministry that we might be able to appreciate what's really going on regardless of how many people may be too obsessed with what the enchantress, also called the media, is telling them. We have so many privileges. And the Lord is saying that in order for us to enjoy those privileges to the full, he wants us to be able to see more of the good in other people. He wants us to be able to communicate the truth in love. He wants us to be able to be at peace with all men. He wants us to be able to tell other people that they are being silly in such a way that they get excited about it. We need to be able to come out from where we have been not to lose the protection, but to be able to bring others into the fold. And for that to happen, we need to learn how to be able to humble ourselves when we are looking at what is going on in the world so that we can see what God sees in other people. So as we break bread today, I want us to tap into that and say, Lord Jesus, the way you saw us as precious, even while we were yet sinners, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that while we were yet sinners, Jesus loved us and died for us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but he still found us. Romans chapter 5, the same. And so, where... I'm, I'm just going to tell you this. I can't wait to tell you. I'm just telling you very quickly. Right? The reason why it was said that Jesus overcame, because when he was raised from the dead, his heavenly father said to him, Arise, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. What Jesus received is what the rest of us are hoping to receive also. Come into the rest of your Lord, you good and faithful servant, because it's only going to be said to the ones who overcame. Jesus overcame simply because of this principle of being able to humble himself to find the good in the lost. And so if we are going to overcome and do more than surviving, we need to elevate to the Jesus mindset. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I'm not just talking about the new age people saying Christ consciousness, so we have all attained Christ consciousness. They say foolish things, but you look at them, no fruits. How can you say you have attained Christ consciousness? And when I look at you, I do not feel his compassion. When I look at you, I do not see his love. When I look at you, I do not see the temperance. I do not see the patience. I do not see the kindness. All of, all of what I see is self-aggrandizement and the need to make more money from other people's attention. I'm like, you have not attained animal consciousness. You are still a stone. But story for another day. As we break bread today, let the Lord Jesus give you his perspective. Let him open your eyes to be able to look 
with humility. To humble yourself when you behold what others are doing. To humble yourself when you hear what others are saying. To humble yourself when you see what is going on in the world. Enough to be able to still fish out whatever good is remaining and bring it onto the boat. Say, Lord, I want to be positioned to receive more insight from you without being puffed up. The Bible says love puffs up. I mean, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. God is getting ready to load us up with artillery with which we will become overcomers for real. But he wants to ensure that there is humility. That we're going to be willing to give ourselves unto others. That we will be the good Samaritan who will stop while we are on our way to go and prophesy to 1,000 people. You will stop and spend time to talk to that one person at the gate waiting to board the same flight or another. The Lord Jesus is saying, I don't want you to miss me. I don't want you to leave me behind. I don't want you to pass on the opportunity to do that which heaven registers in the name of chasing, chasing after that which men expect of you. It is the commission before the ambition. So say, Lord, I want to see like you see. I want to see the good in others. I want to see who you are making them into. Not just what I will benefit from it, but what you will get out of it because all things are yours. Open my eyes, Lord, so that I am not looking with an evil eye that judges, but I look with the eye of compassion that saves. Let there be a transformation in my heart as I receive this new perspective. I want to look down from where you have put me in Christ Jesus at those who may need my love, affection, and attention. I want to look down with humility. I don't want to look down on anybody. I want to look down to the field for service, not for show. I want you to really pray that prayer in your heart and I'm just going to read Matthew 7 and then we're going to open up the eye the cups and eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him just as he said nothing qualifies us for the blood nothing qualifies us for the bread it is the bread it is the body and the blood that qualifies us for the mercy and the grace of God so don't feel like oh you have to have observed certain rituals or fasted and prayed before you eat of his body no it is the body and the blood that brings us salvation that brings us access and so Matthew chapter 5 verse 7 the Bible says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The Lord wants you to learn how to look upon others mercifully. Because then you will obtain the mercy that makes you an overcomer. Let us open up, not just the cup, but also our hearts to receive what the Lord is handing out today. The free gift of a new perspective. You may eat and drink in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God is good. So, Chris Allen, one of them is about to come up to receive the offering and give you some announcements. But I want to remind you of no slumber November. Continue to think about the people that you will invite and don't just think about them. Be like Chris and Kayla. Be a bringer. Chris and Kayla brought two of their friends today. And we, can we just celebrate them, everybody? And just, um, oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. God is good. And so let, let's be bringers, not just inviters. Let's make sure we bring people, not just so that we can fill the room, but because of the fact that we have fire that other people need. You see what I mean? I can tell you that I know that the people in this room have a prayer life. People in this room pray. People in this room study the Word of God. I talk to a lot of people here on a regular basis. You know, I can tell when someone is not praying. You can tell. You know, even though sometimes I don't let you know that I know you're not praying, by, by looking at you like you, you backslided. But the reality of it is, I know people in this room pray and study the word. It is not as common as it needs to be. There are people out there who are no longer praying. They're just panicking. 
There are just many people faint-hearted because they look at the news, they look at the interest rates, they look at all of what's going on, the wars and the rumors of war, and they continue to feel faint-hearted on the inside of them. They still put on their makeup, they still look like, like Barbie dolls, but the reality of it is inside of them, they're like little children crying in fear. But the Bible says men ought always to pray and not to faint. So why we want to bring people is we want them to ignite the heart of intercession and to have them also open their eyes so that they can watch and pray. So please do invite people. God bless you. And the last thing just before I go is this. There is a message that I preached. It was Tuesday last week. If you haven't listened to that message, again, I want to encourage you to listen to the Tuesday message and then immediately, if you can, listen to the Saturday message. You see, because I saw a vision and in the vision there was a chain and it was not connected. It wasn't connected and I sought the Lord and he said to me, there were things that he said through me on Tuesday that people aren't connecting with what I said on Saturday. So I want you to have those things connect for you because it helps you to be able to follow through and to follow what is coming after. Okay, Kayla is about to get up, so that means it's time up. So let, let us just quickly pray. I want to pray for you all before Chris comes up. I want to pray for you real quick. Charles, you to come close to where the people are. You need to be part of this prayer. And so the prayer is in Psalms 107, verse 2 and 3. And I'm just going to declare that over you. And if you want to make note of that, to go and study it on your own later, you don't even have to write it. It's going to be in the tape. No, no, just be where the people are. I just see you too far away from action right there. So be close. Be close, be close, you know. Psalms 107, and we're going to just, I, I will pray this over you, but I want you to um, let the Holy Spirit show you how you need to apply it, okay? Because I am here to instruct, you are here to receive clarity by the Holy Spirit, and then to apply. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north, and from the south. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, your heart will know peace. That your heart will trust in the Lord as the deliverer, as the redeemer. That you will be able to focus on being a fruit bearer when you stop trying to do God's work for him. God's work is to protect you, the one who has redeemed you. His work is to provide for you the one who has paid the price for your salvation. He is your redeemer and he has chosen to find you wherever you might be. He says, I am going on a rampage. I am sweeping from the east to the west, from the north to the south. I will not leave any one of you behind. He says, I will not leave the soul of my beloved in hell. Neither would I allow him to rot in Hades. In Hades, I will find you, I will save you. When you know that and you believe that, you will be confident in him. So every form of agitation and anxiety that causes you depression, I declare it exposed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. So that the light of God that is on the inside of you will drive away every darkness of fear, every darkness of anxiety. The Lord is your redeemer. Know it, believe it, be reminded of it all the time. Live every day, draw breath every moment as though you know that he is your redeemer. The world is telling you that no one is coming to save you. But I am telling you, I'm reminding you what the word of your heavenly father says. He says, I am the one coming for you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. God bless you, communion house. Amen. You can find the uh, tithe and authoring details on the screen. Uh, we've got uh, Cash App, Dollar Sign Communion House, and uh, Zelle information along with PayPal. And I'm definitely with you, Pastor, that uh, going into 2024, it's not about just surviving. It's uh, about overcoming. So God is good. And Brother Kenyatta does have uh, the basket if you have cash or check. Give it a little bit more time here. 
All right, so moving right along, we've got Second Watch coming up on tomorrow, uh, Wednesdays at 9 p.m. on our uh, Instagram, at Communion House, on Instagram at 9 p.m., so definitely be there. Pastor definitely called us out Saturday um, saying that we need to show up and be there, and I myself have been challenged to do the same, so I'll see you guys tomorrow on there. And we're right back at it again on Saturday. Saturday's teaching will begin at 6.30, so look forward to see you guys here. All right, and I just want to, uh, if everybody would just close your eyes and bow your heads, I just want to thank you, Father, for allowing us to make it here safely, Father, allowing us to just get this word just on time, as it always is, from the anointed one. We just thank you, Father, for all you're doing and the way that you're guiding us and just lifting us up and just taking us to another level of your love and your understanding. We just pray that you allow us all to make it safe to our destinations and just allow your spirit just to rest within us and allow us to continue to press on just knowing you and just understanding your love. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.